Good afternoon, everybody. So, you know, when Emanuela Pratoprevide invited me to take part in this workshop, the hypothesis you know, immediately appeared to be so stimulating that it was a yes reflex. Long before, you know, the, the thought reached the level of consciousness. Because if I were totally conscious, I don't know what the answer would have been. So to say that, that today I am honored and grateful to the organizers and to Emanuela in Primis for this invitation. And so my presentation today is, you know, my personal effort in bridging the work I do in the field of horse behavior and welfare to this more multidisciplinary table dealing with the higher concept of empathy. And just to feel, to make you feel relaxed, I will tell you that of course you have to be sentient in order to follow my presentation, so don't fall asleep, please. But you don't need to be so clever as for the other presentation because I will start, I will start for you with a short story and perhaps a challenge for you. So, you know, if you were horses, I would say here something. So this is a picture of Tom Woodcock and Reckless. And it was taken in the late 70s. And Tom Woodcock worked as a groom, so he was caring of horses, for some of the highest performing Australian race horses. And the, you know, the guy with the long mane laying next to Tom was reckless. And the, the night before, he won one of the most remembered Melbourne Cups. So when Bruce Possel, Bruce Possel was the photographer, when he took this picture, Tom begged him not to publish it. You know, he said, you know, if they see me sleeping beside the horse, they will think I'm totally silly, nobody will give me work anymore. But Bruce Possel published the picture anyway, titling it as one. And by doing so, I think, in my opinion, he managed to emphasize the affinity between man and the horse like no other. Now the challenge for you is this one. So would you please show me if you can raise your right hand? Would you please show me if you can? Well done, guys. <laughs> so this was the warming up eh, for you. Now the challenge is uh, the ones of you that think that reckless the horse is experiencing some affective states Please raise your right hand. Yeah. So guys, this, you know, this, I'm so relieved that you know everything about my talk and I can, you know, just go and drink the coffee and... And as a matter of fact, today, public at large agree that animals um, are able of having affective experiences. But most careful scholars, the one who study animal behavior scientifically, need some weighted evidence to prove this. And this was in part, again, an answer to uh, Elisa's question before. Why do we look for that? Because we need it. So, among animals, why do we have horses in the menu today? And, and when I say menu, I'm not literally speaking, of course. Eh? So if you search the literature, there are almost no studies specifically investigating empathy in horses. I found only one exception, where Cozzi and colleagues proved the post-conflict affiliation in a small stable group of horses. So why horses then? Why do we speak about horses today? Because the theme of the day is a bridge across species. And the horses are a highly intriguing species in terms of distances and proximities from us. If you start thinking about distances, 
Horses are what they are, prey species. They are more distant to humans than dogs, for instance. Uh, prey animals, flighty, grass eaters, evolved to eat up to 16 hours a day, always on the move. So a world of differences from humans. And if you simply consider how they perceive the world, they are constantly looking for signs of danger, their eyes are up on the sides of their head, and you know, even if there are conflicting results in studies about color recognition and color vision, most authors agree that they have a dichromatic vision, so they may not be able to distinguish red, red or green depending on the studies you are looking at. And moreover, the human's field of vision is much smaller than the one of the horse and many other differences in perception and behavior. But in terms of proximities, equity represents a part of our common history that have played a unique role in European civilization and they have a high anthropologic affective cultural value. So for 5,000 years they have remained close to humans and have been essential for transport, construction or on farms. And in the 21st century they continue to play myriad of roles. You know, they are perhaps the most versatile animals that humans have domesticated. From spore stars to pets, we have working animals in forestry, agriculture, and even therapy. Not to speak about producers of milk or of meat. So it is estimated that the equine sector in Europe involves 842,000 full-time jobs. How was it possible that so different species remained so close? Perhaps there was something in their appearance that had been fascinating men right from the beginning. This is a possibility. But to me, a reasonable option is that we are both very highly adaptable species. And to me this is an important concept. To, to ab the ability to adapt and the ability to remain close is something to be, yeah, you know, to think about, to pay attention. So now the question is, how can we explore their emotional life and at the end look for evidences of their affective states, which is the basis for empathy? So let's look at some outcomes of my work. The first time I got confronted with the question of empathy was many, many years ago when I was volunteering in some equine-assisted therapy program. It was at the beginning of uh, the 90s. At that time, the responsible of the program genuinely believed that there was no need to select or to train a horse to be used for equine assisted therapy simply because they were naturally, according to her, they were naturally able to perceive the difficulties of patients and they would naturally adapt and respond with a benevolent behavior. So even though somehow fascinating, this theory was alarming for the potential danger deriving to patients from overestimating the capacity of horses to be empathic. So, we, in, in the first study, we evaluated the behavior and heart rate of therapeutic riding horses while interacting with patients during therapy. And we observed systematically behavior of therapeutic riding horses interacting with patients or control riders during therapy sessions. And patients, just, just to be clear, patients and control shared similar physical characteristics and riding abilities. So when ridden by patients, horses showed more potentially dangerous behavior attributable to frustration as bumping the neck up and down, chewing the beat or turns to the leader. 
and horses who are doing similar activities with patients during therapy sessions, however, some of them presented consistently different heart rate when in presence of different patients. Most probably, they were having a different level of arousal with different patients. So the hypothesis that horses were acting benevolently in the presence of humans with difficulties, having, in other words, some form of not cognitive, affective, and help me with the other forms of empathy, was not proven, but we could conclude that horses differently reacted to different patients. And moreover, horses showed more discomfort behaviors with patients compared to control riders. And this suggested to us that they were more aroused, probably as a consequence of inconsistent stimuli given by patients to horses. And this study allowed us, at the very end, to improve their management in order to take better care of their welfare. And you know, if you uh, somehow, if you should ask me a take-home message from that study, I would say that overestimating empathic abilities in animals may have a dark side for their welfare. In a much more recent study, together with a multidisciplinary group of scientists and together with Manuela de la Costa, which is sitting somewhere there, we investigated the facial expressions of horses subjected to a moderate level of pain. And if you are interested you know, in the scientific details of the study, you can download it freely from, from the journal. But pain can be described as an unpleasant sensory but also emotional experience. And the assessment of pain in animals is obviously particularly difficult because there is no verbal means of communication between animals and humans. So, in order to identify suitable means to assess pain in horses, we travel back in history to one of Darwin's intuitions so the scientific studies of the facial expression of emotion began actually with Charles Darwin's The Expression of Emotions in Men and Animals, which was first published in 1872. So Darwin uh, gathered evidence that some emotions have a universal facial expression, suggesting that emotions are evident in other animals and recognizable by individuals of different species. But, I mean, this was a catastrophe at the time, a revolutionary idea at the time. So we had to wait until the late 60s because that was the first that, sorry, hypothesized what we today know that emotions have an adaptive role and they are expressed, communicated and understood by others that can help. So, we had to wait until the 60s for systematic studies on facial expressions of primary emotions in humans, and especially Ekman and Fraser, work was based on a multicultural study that proved that both facial expressions and their interpretation did not change from country to country. And today, facial expressions are used to evaluate emotions and pain, especially in non-verbalized humans, so in infants, but also in Alzheimer's patients. And the approaches used in human infants can provide a framework for animal pain assessment. Today, since 2010, facial expressions of pain have been used to assess pain in, uh, in mice, but also rats and rabbits, However, emitting visible signs of facial expressions of pain might not have been selected in prey animals like horses. But, you know, even without scientific results, do you think that you can recognize if these horses are in pain? Well, just, just think of it. Using facial expression might offer a unique, powerful scientific tool to investigate horse emotions. So, in our study, we aimed to develop and validate a standardized pain scale based on facial expressions of horses. And so, 
just briefly, we took 46 horses with no pre-existing painful conditions and all the horses were hospitalized in the clinic for five days and one group of horses underwent routine surgical castration under general anesthesia and the other horses underwent general anesthesia for non-invasive and indolent diagnostic procedures but not surgery and they were used as controls. So we took 30 minute videos of horses in their own box the day prior of the study and as a baseline and 8 hours post-surgery using high definition video camera positioned on the top opposite box, top opposite sides of the box. And therefore, from each video recording, still images of the horses were extracted, enabling the generation of a number of clear and high quality pictures. And each image was cropped so that only the head of the horse was visible. And this prevented the observers from being biased you know, by the overall general appearance of, of the horse. Not moving anymore? Okay. A total of 126 pictures were randomly selected and they were mixed, you know, like uh, cards uh, and distributed by email to five treatment blinds participants together with a detailed handout uh, about how to recognize facial expressions. And the participants were asked to evaluate each image and to give a score for each facial action unit using a three-point scale so not present, moderately present, or obviously present. Well, this is yeah, what uh, the sort of guideline that they received. So blind observers successfully attributed the faces of the horses to before or after the surgery, while they did not found, find sorry, any differences for controls. And they agreed well on their scores of specific areas of the horse's face. So based on these results, we developed the horse grimace face scale that was composed by six facial action units, as you can see in the picture. So, in pain conditions, ears are held stiffly, turned backwards, sidewards, and the movements are reduced. So, no reaction to environmental sounds is present. And horses in pain display also a narrowing of the orbital area, dropping eyelids, and in traversive glands. They have an increased muscular tension in the area above the eye. So the contraction of the muscle causes the increased visibility of the underlying bone surfaces. And prominent strain tune muscles are clearly visible, you know, as an increasing tension above in the area above the mouth part. And if you look at the mouse, you can see that the upper lip is drawn back and lower lip causes a pronounced chin. Nostrils. Nostrils look strained, slightly dilated, and the profile flattens and elongates. So this study was conducted under the Animal Welfare Indicator project that, that was funded uh, by EU under the 7th framework program and aiming, aimed to address animal welfare indicators in sheep, goats, turkeys, horses and donkeys. And uh, the outstanding innovation is that each work package produces educational material which is freely available on, on the app. And I don't know why it went to quick. Okay. So I had a video, but never mind, it, 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 it didn't work. Another study I would like to present is about fear. 
and how we can assess fear in horses. Horses are prey species, and as such, it is in their nature, in fear eliciting situation, to show flight reaction, which can be dangerous for both the horse and the handler. So finding appropriate indicators for assessing fear in horses has important, not only scientific, but also practical implications, not only for science, but also for human safety. So the aim of the present study were to assess feasibility and validity of a fear test in adult sport horses and to investigate whether the exposure to fearful stimulus stimulus induces a change in eye temperature. Horses that were described by caretakers as more prone to panic, vigilant, excitable, skittish, nervous, needed significantly longer time to reapproach a novel object. And eye temperature was significantly higher after the novel object compared to basin with more fearful subjects tending to present larger increases. This picture is an example of changes in the caracol temperature of three horses. You know, on the left there is the visible image, on the right the thermographic images before and after the novel object test. So it's very intuitive that we had a change in eye temperature. You know, for those of you who really are very active and wish to explore more, you can investigate more studies about the work we have done about the motion of horses. But I would like to end, if technology assists me, I would like to end up with something funny and about a video that we realized for the Meet Me tonight. And this was about education, and it was our personal effort in, you know, making something for empathy and education of the young ones with the work we do on animal behavior.
So thank you for your attention and open for questions.